world climate change crisis. But can a global climate conference help save the planet? Will COP26 in Glasgow make a difference? Raging wildfires, record heat, melting ice packs, rising sea levels, massive flooding, deadly hurricanes, climate refugees, the Amazon rainforest in peril, CGTN America's Global Action Initiative, Project Earth, starts now. Welcome to CGTN America's Global Action Initiative 2021, Project Earth, focusing on climate change. I'm Anand Naidu. The world is gripped by a massive climate crisis, and it's about to get much worse if we don't take action now. Earlier this year, the authors of a United Nations scientific report concluded that global warming will hit 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040, even if emissions were cut today. The UN Secretary General said the report is a code red for humanity. But this crisis is much more than just about numbers, projections, carbon levels and emissions. It's about people. All of us, our planet, our future, our very existence. A critical climate summit, COP26, is now underway in Glasgow, and Chinese President Xi Jinping has issued a written statement to the conference. He said we need to uphold multilateral consensus on dealing with climate change. President Xi also called for a focus on concrete actions and for parties to honour their commitments, and he stressed the need to accelerate the green transition. CGT in America is bringing you a major special, Global Action Initiative 2021, Project Earth. Over the next few days, we will take you inside the climate crisis as we explore potential solutions and action. And some of those solutions will be offered by young climate activists. During this program, we will examine the challenges we are already living with, and you will learn more about China's engagement and its efforts to fight the climate crisis. We have a major panel of guests and lots of discussion ahead. You will hear from the president of China Media Group, the Chinese ambassador to the United States, the president of Sierra Leone, Iceland's prime minister, the minister of environment for Ecuador, Egypt's minister of environment, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Maldives, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, a World Bank Vice President, a global expert on agriculture, a leading youth environmental activist from South Africa, an international panel of climate experts, all coming up. So let's get to it. We begin with the head of China Media Group, Shen Haixiong. 尊敬的各位嘉宾生态危机也使得推动构建人类命运共同体的愿景将力争
二零六零年前实现太宗和。我的家乡浙江，是中国东南沿海富饶的鱼米之乡。在我做记者的时候啊，走遍了那里的山山水水，深深体会到习近平主席当年在浙江率先倡导和实践的“绿水青山就是金山银山”理念。所带来的人与自然和谐相处，生态优先，绿色发展所创造的发展契机。今年四月，地处中国西南的云南省，十多头亚洲象北上远足，总台进行了长达五个月的跟踪报道，形成了现象级的传播。这些憨态可掬的现大象，圈粉世界。云南大象之谜，让人们领略了中国生态文明建设的成果。作为国际主流媒体和中国国家广播电视台，中央广播电视总台始终秉持负责任媒体的职责使命，努力提高公众对生态文明建设的关注与认知。今年，总台出品的纪录片《国家公园：野生动物王国》，在全球发行已经超过了一百个国家和地区。CGTN 每年的东非野生动物大迁徙直播报道，都会牵动亿万观众的心。我们愿意和全球媒体同行一起，继续讲述更多“花莫变绿绿洲，人与自然和谐共处”的故事。人不负青山，青山定不负人。让我们行动起来，让地球恢复健康，让共识。替代旗舰，共同构建地球生命共同体，守护好我们共有的家园。谢谢大家。Africa is already being hit by major climate change problems, including drought, rising sea levels, and a growing number of climate refugees. Here now is the president of Sierra Leone, Julius Madabio. Thank you for inviting me to this year's Global Action Initiative on Climate Change. This is an important forum that I believe will serve as a springboard for ideas and innovations on fighting climate change. As we are seeing all around us, climate change is an existential threat which the world needs to urgently tackle in a unified manner. All around us, we see evidence of extreme weather, dangerous storms, deadly flooding, frequent forest fires, and rising temperatures that threaten humanity. As these weather patterns intensify, the world is already seeing hundreds of thousands of people being forced to flee their homes. Every day now, we hear the term climate refugees. Nowhere is the impact of climate disruptions being felt more than in developing countries. Sierra Leone is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. My government has taken several steps to mitigate the impact of climate change, including the establishment of a standalone ministry of the environment and the establishment of the interministerial committee on climate-related issues. Our pledge to plant five million trees by 2023, setting up early warning systems for climate resilience, establishing a national disaster management agency, revised our national climate change policy, prepared and submitted to the UNFCCC our nationally determined contribution and drawing up on a national mitigation action plan, among other actions. But when it comes to climate change, no nation is an island. We have to tackle this threat as one if we are to protect the only home we know, planet Earth. The COVID-19 pandemic, the climate and biodiversity crisis cannot be tackled in isolation. There are 7.8 billion people in the world, and around 26% of that population is under 15 years of age. 
In Africa, that number is 40%. Can we afford to leave a burning, smoldering, waterlogged planet to our future generations? The young generation understands the magnitude of the problem and the urgency of solutions. Today, they are, they are taking the lead to fight for a planet that we inherit from us. And we must support them all the way. I've called upon world leaders to take urgent action by fully implementing the, the letter and spirit of the Paris Accord. To fight climate change, we must also reject isolationism and geopolitical tension. We must confront poverty, violence, injustice, and corruption. We must reaffirm our collective commitment to multilateralism. All nations, big and small, must step up and fulfill their commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And in that regard, the Global Action Initiative is an important platform, not only to highlight the growing crisis, but also to focus on solutions and innovations. We turn now to Iceland. The North Atlantic nation is worried about rising temperatures and melting ice glaciers. Let's listen now to Iceland's Prime Minister, Katrin Jakobsdottir. I'm Katrin Jakobsdottir, and I'm the Prime Minister of Iceland. Climate, the climate crisis is really the most pressing issue of our times. And I'm very proud to belong to a nation which has actually achieved a lot of good things when it comes to the usage of renewable energies. In fact, over 80% of our energy use is from renewables. But still, we have a lot of work to do to really make the transition complete over to renewables. And this is a really important issue for us because we actually see the consequences of climate change happening in our backyard. We see our glaciers slowly moving back and melting. We see differences in the ocean around us. We see increased acidification in the sea. We see a changed behavior in the fish that travels around the country. And that's why we know, who are so closely related to nature, how important it is to fight the climate crisis. And we do that by really making a complete transition over to renewables and change the way we are living. I think it's possible. I think the climate crisis is a result of human activities. And that's why I believe that human activities also can make that change that's necessary. So this is one of the biggest and pre most pressing issues of our times. But the leaders of the world need to do more to really make that step so we can actually fight back. Across Latin America and the Caribbean, climate change is causing extreme weather incidents. Countries in the region are experiencing devastating hurricanes, heavy rainfall and severe heat waves. Ecuador is planning ahead and taking action. Here is the country's Minister of the Environment, Gustavo Manrique. Thank you for inviting me to the Global Action Initiative. I want to start by talking about climate change solutions in Ecuador. Ecuador emits only 0.18% of greenhouse gas worldwide. Although it's a really low figure, in these first 140 days of governance, we have shown that our commitment to respond to climate change is really firm. When we talk about climate change, it is enough to refer to the last 10 years, which have been the hottest in the history. The rise of sea level or extreme rainfall are issues that we face daily, both in Ecuador and worldwide. According to the IPCC World Report, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, which dictates the environmental radiography of the planet, concludes with alarming issues that leave no doubt that the cause of climate change is the human being, and if 
today we fail to do the things we have to do together, the temperature on the planet will increase by 1.5 degrees in nine years, which will be catastrophic for humanity. In Ecuador, for the first time, we work cross-cutting public policy on the environmental matters. The National Transitional Pact towards decarbonization serves as an evidence, as we sign it together with several ministers of states. That will define the roadmap to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in different sectors of the economy, promoting a just, ecological and sustainable transition. We have an emblematic projects and programs under mechanisms such as payment for results, that is the payment for reduction of emissions from forest deforestation, such as red early movers, REM, and Pro Amazonia, which we develop with the Green Climate Fund and lead together with the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock. Additionally, we have regulatory frameworks, such as circular economy law, single-use plastic law, the Subnational Climate Fund to finance infrastructure projects in mitigation, and the Ecuador Zero program to offset the carbon footprint, in which the involvement of the private sector is fundamental. Today, we know that we have come up with different responsibilities. An example of this is that waste from other countries arrive on our shores. So together with Germany, Vietnam, and Ghana, we convened more than 140 countries to discuss public policy for the conservation of our seas. But this is not just a public policy issue. We know that it's a shared task where young people have become an example of that transition to the ecology that we need. Our main goal is to meet global commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 22.5% by year 2025. To achieve this, the national government, together with the state institutions, the private sector, and citizens in general, is laying the foundations for the transition to decarbonization with important steps that in the short, medium, and long term will allow Ecuador to advance to a new developing model, driven by the credentials of conservation of its natural heritage that the world needs to move forward with. We move next to Egypt. It's worried about the impact climate change is having on rising sea levels and coastal erosion, but it is taking action. Here now is Egypt's Minister of Environment, Yasmin Fouad. From climate change, to loss of biodiversity, to land degradation, to pollution, in our seas and oceans. Now it is the time to act. More action is needed than words, and implementation of the Paris Agreement is the only way for the rescue of our Earth planet. Egypt has been endeavoring a lot of efforts throughout the past few years. The country is vulnerable to the impact of climate change from sea level rise to coastal erosion, to change in the crops in the agriculture field. Although Egypt has not emitted and the greenhouse gases emissions is very minimal, yet it will be hardly and adversely affected by the impact of climate change. We've changed the narratives around the environment. That narrative starts from the political momentum and the political support from the president in order to provide more strength to the sustainability and environmental profile. We now have our National Council for Climate Change headed by the Prime Minister. And that is the reason why we think it's important to mainstream climate change in other development sectors by having that at the highest level. More efforts have been done in the mitigation sector, a new system for solid waste management, as well as a presidential initiative for changing the vehicles to work with compressed natural gas and support to the public transport for a better 
for a new e-mobility scheme in Egypt. This is add, add to that as well our system in order to better adapt to climate change, the establishment of 16 urban cities away from the Delta, the new treated wastewater stations, as well as the desalination using the solar energy. Also, more efforts is being done at the level of the North Coast for more protection of our coastal area, but also for more adaptation to our community and to sustain their livelihood. To fight air pollution, Egypt has also done a lot of effort. Within every challenge that Egypt has been facing in the pollution, an opportunity has been born. An opportunity has been born throughout our youth. In the way they are reducing the use of the plastic bags, they are creating more alternative. How we are now recycling the electronic waste and having the youth leading and managing that application of Ethan Weir. How did we announce our first nationwide campaign called Live Green? How did we support the youth in order to go and clean the cities and clean the River Nile and come up with more jobs to the fishermen around that beautiful Nile? Many, many stories that we can tell, but the story that is really very difficult for the whole world right now is our fight against climate change. If actions would be louder than words, if we are able to treat both mitigation and adaptation equally, if we are able to put means of implementation that is climate finance, technology transfer, and capacity development at the heart of the Paris Agreement and its rule book, if everyone would assume their responsibilities as agreed upon, we will be able to save the planet Earth because simply we have no other planet, no option B for livelihood in this world without saving our planet. Coming up, we will bring you reports from climate crisis points across the globe. Martin Lowe is in Thailand and looks at the danger posed by rising sea levels. Paolo Cabral reports from the heart of the Amazon rainforest on how deforestation is putting it in jeopardy. Edith Tiansen has been covering California's devastating wildfires. And Adele El Makruki reports from Egypt on the threat to coral in the Red Sea. There is much to come as we continue now with our Global Action Initiative 2021 Project Earth. We go next to Chin Gong, China's ambassador to the United States. He talks with students about climate change. I would like to know what uh, the leaders of China are doing to combat climate change. What is the government doing towards like fighting car pollution and helping um, stop climate change? Chinese leaders attach great importance to climate change. As early as 16 years ago, President Xi Jinping famously said, green mountains are gold mountains and silver mountains. In September last year, President Xi announced that China aims to have CO2 emission peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Recently, China introduced a working guidance and an action plan in this field. This fully demonstrates China's commitment to addressing climate change as a major country and our strategic determination to pursue green, low carbon, and circular development. President Xi gave a comprehensive and a systematic account of the vision of building a community of life for man and the nature at the Leaders' Summit on Climate last April, contributing Chinese wisdom and the solutions to climate change and the environmental governance. At the COP15 recently held in Kunming, Yunnan province, President Xi called for 
working together to build a community of all life on Earth. Giant panda, which is the people's favorite in many countries, has been downgraded from endangered to vulnerable on the global list of species at risks of extinction. And this number in the wild has grown from more than 1,100 to over 1,800 now. As we speak, the COP26 is taking place in Glasgow. At the summit, President Xi called upon all parties to uphold multilateral consensus, focus on concrete actions, and accelerate green transition in our united action to tackle climate change and protect the planet, our shared home. Speaking of human impact on climate, many people would think of vehicle emission. China has been making hard efforts to reduce vehicle emissions and encouraging green transport, and such efforts have paid off. China's stage six vehicle emission standards implemented in most of the country are one of the most stringent in the world, stricter than those in the United States. In other words, many cars running on American streets right now are prohibited in China. At the same time, China's industry of new energy vehicles has developed tremendously, with a total of 6 million new energy vehicles. That is to say, half of the world's new energy vehicles are running on the streets of China. China has built 1.87 million charging piles and a fast charging network covering 176 cities and more than 50,000 kilometers, so that those vehicles can really go far and wide without hassle. It only took Tesla one year to build its first super factory outside the US in Shanghai, with an annual output of 450,000 vehicles. Last month, the number of Tesla's supercharger in China exceeded 1,000. Elon Musk, Tesla CEO, said, I really think China is the future. The Chinese government also encourages people to go green in transport. We implement a policy to limit vehicle traffic based on the and number of license plates. In Beijing, nearly one-fifth of the vehicles cannot go on public road on a working day. And the people can choose to carpool or take the subway. The past few years have seen an explosive growth of shared bicycles in China. Take out your phone, scan the QR code, and you have the most trendy, convenient, and a green means of transport in a few seconds. There are now less than 100 days to go before the Beijing Winter Olympics, which will be the first Olympics in history to use all green and clean energy. We have made full use of the venues and the facilities of the 2008 Summer Games and adopted ice-making technology with almost zero emissions to turn the water cube into an ice cube. Green will be the most prominent color of the Beijing Winter Olympics. 共同带有区别的责任，那请问在气候变化的领域，中美共同的责任是什么？有所区别的责任又是什么？谢谢。Are there like viewpoints 
similar to ours when it comes to climate change. 呃，当前中美两国在可再生能源技术领域都有较快的发展。按照当前的发展水平，您认为中美两国是否有望实现各自的碳中和目标呢 ？What plans they have to partner with the United States to battle climate change？ 您认为美国和中国在这个题目上有过合作吗 ？Addressing climate change is the shared mission of all countries, but developed and the developing countries. Have different responsibilities. A cartoon vividly describes this scenario. A lanky man in ragged clothes is cooking over firewood. A person who drives a large displacement luxury car points to him and says, "What an enormous carbon emission! Your cooking is causing global warming." I think we must take an objective and a scientific approach to emission reduction responsibilities. Development is the right of everyone in every country. Developing countries need to develop their economies and improve people's livelihoods. Their people have the right to live the same lives as people in New York, San Francisco, or Washington. On climate change, they deserve more understanding and support from developed countries. We cannot ask a man who barely has enough to eat to go on a diet and lose weight. While considering the needs of development for the current stage, we also need to look back into history. From the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the mid 18th century to 1950, developed countries emitted 95 percent of the total carbon dioxide. From 1950 to 2000, they still account for 77 percent of the total emissions. That's why developed countries should shoulder more responsibilities on climate change. And fulfill their promises of providing financial and technological support to developing countries. As main actors on climate change, both China and the United States should first rely on themselves to fulfill their nationally determined contributions. This is just like students from different grades will have different test questions, but both countries. Should answer their own test papers well. At the same time, what matters in the test of climate change is the total scores of all students, not the score of just one student. Tackling climate change requires persistent efforts. Countries should have long-term and stable policies. The U.S. is a top student, but it also has a record of skipping classes and withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. If it wants to score high in future tests, it should not skip classes or hand in its homework late anymore. China will strive to pick its carbon dioxide emissions before 2030. And achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Moving from carbon picking to carbon neutrality takes the United States 43 years, but China has set a target of 30 years, which means that it will experience the world's most intensive carbon emission reduction. To achieve this goal, as a developing country, China needs. To pay greater prices and efforts than the United States, we have closed and will continue to close energy-intensive, high-emission factories. For example, between 2016 and 2019, China reduced its steel production capacity by more than 150 million tons, at the price of 280,000 steel jobs. Which exceeds the total number of jobs in the steel industry in the United States 
the EU, and the Japan combined. But still, we will honor our promises with real actions. In terms of fulfilling its commitments and the targets, China's carbon emission intensity in 2020 dropped by 18.8% from the 2015 level and 48.4% from the 2005 level. This means that cumulatively, China avoided about 5.8 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions. By the end of 2020, China had 220 million hectares of forest and over 9.1 billion tons of forest carbon reserves. We have also formulated a detailed roadmap towards carbon picking and the carbon neutrality. And we are vigorously developing clean and renewable energy while reducing coal use. By 2025, the share of non-fossil fuels in total energy consumption will reach around 20%, while carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP will drop by 18% compared with 2020 level, laying a solid foundation for carbon dioxide peaking. Addressing climate change requires closed cooperation among countries, including the China and the United States. We have issued a joint statement addressing the climate crisis, reiterating that we will strengthen cooperation and jointly contribute to the global response to climate change and work together to keep the global temperature rise below 2 centigrade and strive to limit it to 1.5 centigrade. We are also working together for a successful COP26. Chinese and American scientists can carry out joint research in low carbon technology, green energy, and other fuels. The two sides established a clean energy research center before, and we have a huge potential for cooperation in electric vehicles, renewable energy, green finance, and a digital economy. For example, China has a complete industrial chain in equipment manufacturing for wind power and PV power generation. And its output of PV cells and modules ranks first in the world. These are areas where our two sides can effectively cooperate. We can also jointly help those countries that are vulnerable to climate impact and carry out third-party cooperation to improve their capability against climate change. Climate change is a highlight of China-US cooperation that leads to the direction of global efforts. We hope that our two countries can take the COP26 as an opportunity, bear in mind the interests of all mankind, rise above the political microclimate that hinders our cooperation, and lead global efforts to counter the warming global climate. Over the next few days, we will have lots more to bring you on our Global Action Initiative 2021 Project Earth. And later in the show, we will talk about COP26. Now, let's welcome our distinguished international panel of climate experts. With us here in Washington, D.C. is Changbao Wu. She is the CEO of the Beijing Future Innovation Center. From New Delhi, we're joined by Arunabo Ghosh. He is Chief Executive Officer, Council on Energy, Environment and Water. That has been ranked as one of the world's best climate think tanks. 
Also with us in Washington is Michael K. Dorsey. He is an expert on global energy, environment, finance and sustainability matters. And he's a member of the Club of Rome. And from London, we're joined by Bob Ward. He is Policy and Communications Director with the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change. Thank you all for joining us. We have much to discuss, and I want to take a closer look now at some climate crisis zones. Let's start with rising sea levels in Asia. CGTN correspondent Martin Lowe has this report from Thailand. This is a Buddhist temple. It's one of thousands in Thailand. But what's happened here is very different. And from the air, you can see why. Because of rising sea levels and coastal erosion, the temple's completely surrounded by water. It was once at the centre of a thriving village, but the homes, farms and school are long gone, swallowed by the sea. The temple remains only because of a stone wall that's been constructed to keep the water at bay. Electricity poles poke above the waves, marking where the roads once ran. The temple floors had to be repeatedly raised to keep the religious artefacts dry. Scientists say this temple on the shore of the Gulf of Thailand is one of the clearest examples of the effects of climate change. Over the past three decades, the sea has risen by two metres and advanced more than a kilometre inland. Those who once lived here have had to abandon their homes and move away. Thailand's bustling capital, Bangkok, stands just 50 kilometres from this spot and itself could one day be in danger. And all the while, the sea just keeps on rising. Martin Lowe, CGTN, Samut Chin, Thailand. Arunaba Ghosh, I want to start with you. As we just saw in that report from Martin Lowe, there was a temple in Thailand which was surrounded by water and it's only 50 miles or 80 kilometers from Bangkok, which is one of the major cities in uh, Thailand. How much of a threat uh, are rising sea levels in Asia, particularly in countries like India and Bangladesh? Anand, uh, the rising sea levels are absolutely a sign of climate change. We are already locked in to at least a one meter rise of sea levels globally. Um, even with the kind of global average uh, rise in temperatures that we've experienced. So even if we stopped all emissions right now, we're still going to be experiencing this over the course of this century and beyond. So what uh, that temple in Thailand is experiencing is something that coastal cities in, say, Bangladesh, in, uh, in India, in uh, other parts of Southeast Asia are going to experience. Now, what that means is it's not just the loss of lives, but it's also the loss of livelihoods. Because rising sea levels, wh uh, what it does is it, the water, the seawater begins to come into land. So what was once fertile land to grow, say, rice, suddenly becomes infertile because you're, you now have a much higher degree of salinity in the soil. So it's even if the land was still there uh, 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 with the sea levels coming, uh, with the sea uh, coming in and out, you still have a, a, a region that becomes much harder to support communities that are living along the coast. And across uh, India, which is 7,000 kilometers, more than 7,000 kilometers of coastline, Bangladesh, which is one of the lowest lying uh, uh, countries in the world, and of course, many parts of Southeast Asia, this is going to be a very, very critical crisis, not just an environmental one, but an economic one as well. Chang Wawu, let's look at the risks and challenges that rising sea levels pose in China. Uh, earlier this year, the Chinese Environment Ministry noted that China's coastal areas have risen by over three millimeters per year over the recent few decades. How much of a threat does rising sea levels pose for China, especially when we look at big cities like Shanghai? The risk is huge, and it's already, pro it's already proven. Uh, you mentioned Shanghai. Actually, Shanghai is located in the Yangtze River Delta region. Not only the, this region, but also the Pearl River Delta region, where Guangzhou, Shenzhou are next to Hong Kong. And that particular region has also proven very vulnerable. China, if you look at the coastal areas, uh, more than uh, half of the population uh, clustered reside actually in coastal regions there. And this region, ha you know, the coastal region happens to be the economically most advanced population most densely populated. And if you look at the, you know, the concentration of industrial uh, activities, manufacturing, supply chain, whatever, 
many, many of them actually are located in these regions there. From an impact perspective, and I think flooding, uh, sea level rise plus actually flooding, uh, you know, has been experienced more and more. We already started to experience coastal erosion and, uh, and also damage to coastal habitats, as well as salinization of surface and groundwater there. So the impact is huge. I think one, of course, on people, people's lives and the livelihoods, and then also on the infrastructure, infrastructure, both the urban infrastructure, but also industrial infrastructure. And, uh, and also, actually, we've started to see, you know, damages actually to the ecosystems along the coastal areas, like wetlands, uh, you know, and other habitats, and already threatening dramatically uh, the other lives on Earth as well. Now, let's talk about a country that we hear about very often, that is the Maldives. There is a real threat to the Maldives. 80% of the islands in the South Asian archipelago state are just a meter above sea level. Let's listen to the country's Minister of Foreign Affairs and UN General Assembly President, Abdullah Shahid. The message we are receiving is very clear that no one is safe until everyone is safe. President Saleh, in his uh, address to the UN General Assembly uh, this year, said that if Maldives is not to survive because it is a low-lying country, there is no potential for any other countries, whether they are high in the mountains or not, to survive because this is a very interconnected world. Bob Ward, uh, the minister, also said recently that the Maldives could disappear by the end of the century. Scientists have warned that sea levels could rise by 1.1 metres by the end of the century. Can the trend be reversed in any way? Well, we've locked in, unfortunately, sea level rise for many of the coming decades because the enormous amount of heat that has been absorbed by the world's, world's oceans has locked in a, a, a process of ocean water expanding, thermal expansion. There are three contributors to sea level rise. One is that ocean water expands when it warms. There's also increasing water coming into the oceans because of the uh, melting of the uh, po major polar ice sheets in West Antarctica and in uh, Greenland, which are on land. And then there's also the melting of glaciers. All three of those factors are causing sea level to rise gradually. And even if we stop warming tomorrow, the sea level rise will continue for, for many decades afterwards. The small island states, like the Maldives, made a very strong case in Paris in 2015, when countries were gathering to m reach a new agreement, to say we have to limit the warming to no more than one and a half Celsius degrees above pre-industrial level, because if it gets up to two, then we're talking about levels of sea level rise that will wipe them off the map. It will simply uh, eventually completely flood and cover them all together. So that is why those small island states like the Maldives are so concerned about us really cutting emissions strongly enough that we limit the rise in warming to uh, no more than one and a half degrees. And we've already had more than one degree of warming. OK, I want to play a clip now from a CGTN documentary called Zero R about climate change in China. And we hear from a student at Tsinghua University, Cheng Haosheng. In 2017, a strong typhoon caused extensive damage as it passed through Cheng's hometown of Macau. Ten people were killed. It was the first time he witnessed the impact of climate change on human beings and life. Chang Wu, the young people we see and hear in the documentary are clearly concerned about climate change. If we look at what happened in China earlier this year, there was massive flooding there. Uh, how much of that is linked to climate change? And can we expect to see more of that kind of extreme weather in China? Uh, the scientists are telling us, I think, you know, in terms of attribution, uh, you know, for China's flooding, it's absolutely because climate change issues there. And I don't think anyone or many people are doubting that scientific evidence anymore. So it's strongly linked. In terms of the frequency, intensity, and the severity of flooding, China is definitely one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. 
uh, from the damage perspective or impact perspective, not only impacting the largest number of people, because, again, the China has 1.4 billion people. And also, actually, if you look at the economic impact, just direct economic impacts there is a huge. China ranks probably the, the highest cost, actually, in terms of the flooding damage to its economy. And, uh, you know, U.S. and other countries probably, you know, similar range as well, but China definitely stands out. And moving forward, of course, this year we already had this uh, two major events. One is uh, centered around Henan, and with more than 300 people died. And uh, economic cost is now costing about $25 billion there for one extreme weather event. And just recently, Shanxi province, which is a coal mining center of the country, uh, also experienced flooding. And uh, 60 coal mines literally submerged right at the critical moment when China was experiencing this power shortage there. So the impact is huge. And moving forward, I know the trend will hold on. And uh, so it's a critical question on the table for the global uh, you know, Chinese communicate, you know, the decision makers. On one side, of course, we need to address the mitigation as soon as possible. In the meantime, we need to really put more attention to adaptation and resilience. Michael Dorsey, here in the United States, we are also seeing the impact of extreme weather. We're seeing flooding, wildfires. Uh, we've even uh, seen hurricanes uh, in the United States. Uh, we saw deadly flooding in Manhattan, actually, earlier, which is right in the heart of New York City. Are you surprised at how quickly we are seeing the effects of extreme weather? Absolutely not, Anand. You know, really, these extreme events, weather events, We've been forecasting and predicting them now for really decades. Uh, unfortunately, uh, political leaders haven't been responding uh, robustly enough to this unfolding climate crisis that we are fully in the midst of now. We lost over four dozen lives in New York as a result of Hurricane Ida uh, just weeks ago. Most of those lives were poor, black and brown uh, citizens, migrants, uh, working class folks. So the burden of this unfolding climate crisis falls disproportionately on the poorest of the poor amongst us, certainly in the U.S., but also around the world. And ironically, those that are the poorest of the poor contribute the least to the unfolding climate crisis. So it's really not surprising at all. It's something that uh, policymakers and scientists have known for quite some time. All right, let's move now to another climate crisis issue. This year, the western United States was ravaged by wildfires. Edith Janssen has this report from California. California's wildfires are becoming more frequent and more destructive than ever before. This year, the state reached a new milestone with over 1.6 million hectares of land burned, an area larger than the U.S. state of Connecticut. That's more than double the previous state record for the most land burned in a single year, a record set even before the end of the wildfire season. This year's Dixie Fire has become the largest single wildfire ever recorded in California. In fact, six of the ten largest fires in state history have taken place since 2020. Scientists say this is clearly the result of man-made climate change. And its impact has been devastating. Scores of lives have been lost, along with tens of thousands of homes. Entire towns have been reduced to ashes, leaving thousands of people displaced. What's fueling these wildfires is extreme heat and increasingly dry conditions. This past June was the hottest on record for North America. California is in a drought for the second year in a row. It's facing a severe water shortage and people are asked to conserve water. And major industries like agriculture are taking a big hit. Climate change here is having an impact on every aspect of people's daily lives. California is seen as a leader in climate change legislation and innovation, but without global action, its efforts alone aren't enough to stop the trend. And many Californians are frustrated that extreme heat waves and destructive wildfires like these are becoming a normal part of their lives. It is Tian Shan, CGTN, Southern California. Bob Ward, we've also seen these wildfires ravage parts of Europe. If we look at Germany, if we look at Greece, it's also destroyed millions of hectares of forest. It's caused smoke pollution as well. Um, could we see more of these kinds of fires driven by these rising temperatures? 
Well, the trends we're seeing now are going to continue for at least the next 30 years because the impacts of climate change will continue until the world gets to effectively zero emissions of greenhouse gases. And the earliest that could happen is 2050. So we know that this is linked to climate change. Several parts of the world are seeing lower rainfall. Those drought conditions promote the kind of dryness of vegetation. But all parts of the world are becoming warmer. Warmer weather means you suck up more of the moisture, you get increased rates of evaporation, and it means that many parts of the world now have vast areas of vegetation which all they need is a source of ignition, either natural or man-made, and then you'll get the wildfire spreading uh, very fast. And it's happening in parts of the world that don't have wildfires normally. Even parts of Siberia have started to have these large wildfires. For countries that have them already, they're seeing them become more intense and spreading much more quickly, and it kills people. People who live near to forests often find that wildfires move so quickly that they cannot escape them, and before they know it, not only do they lose their homes, they lose their lives as well. All right, let's look now at how the climate crisis is impacting the Amazon rainforest that is so critical to biodiversity. Our reporter Paulo Cabral filed this report from Brazil on the threat posed by deforestation and the conflict between development and concerns over the environment. Anand, I'm in the heart of the Amazon, the world's largest rainforest. It covers about 40% of South America, spanning eight countries with Brazil having the largest share. It plays a crucial role in our climate system because of its capacity to absorb large amounts of carbon dioxide. But there are major fears about how much of the Amazon is being lost to deforestation and the climate impact that this will have. Roads, for example, are often major drivers of destruction in the Amazon as they make it easier for farmers, cattle ranchers, loggers and gold miners to develop their activities. And environmentalists fear that a project to pave long stretches of this road, the BR-319, could further speed up devastation in this region. Brazil's challenge is to find a model of sustainable development that can generate wealth and benefit people here while keeping this important rainforest alive. Paulo Cabral, CGTN, in the Brazilian Amazon. Arunaba Ghosh, as we are all aware, uh, the Amazon rainforest is vitally important to biodiversity. There was a conference in Kunming in China attended by more than 100 countries, and they called for, quote, urgent and integrated action on biodiversity. How critical is the protection of the Amazon uh, rainforest, not just to Latin America, but to the whole world? We've heard often that the Amazon rainforest are the lungs of the world. Indeed, they are the lungs of the world. And, and it's very important that the conference on biodiversity happened just a few weeks before the conference on climate change, because the two are linked. Uh, because until and unless we recognize that it's not just about protecting forests in one country, but this is a public good. What is there in South America, and particularly in Brazil, is delivering a global public good for all of us. And then, like this uh, South American rainforest, there are the rainforests in Central Africa, and then there are the rainforests in Southeast Asia, and also in parts of India. Now, these are part of a global system that uh, begins to regulate the way the, the carbon in the atmosphere is absorbed and the oxygen that is released. More than that, it's not just what is absorbed from the, from the atmosphere, it's also the carbon that is then retained in the soil. Once you chop down the rainforest, you're not just losing the trees, but you're also threatening the, the integrity of the soils. And there's multiple times more carbon stored in the soils compared to what's stored in, 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 uh, in the atmosphere. So once you threaten the integrity of the soils, you are then threatening that uh, the carbon will start getting released from degraded soils. So you are compounding that effect. So we should stop thinking about saving the rainforest as just an environmental issue in one particular geography, but as something that is absolutely integral to maintaining the carbon balance across the world, but also the balance of many other uh, nutrients that regulate our planetary system. Michael Dorsey, what are your thoughts on the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest? I mean, it also raises the question 
uh, a conflict really uh, between the interests of farmers and loggers who say, look, we need the land, and then environmentalists who point to the risks of deforestation, especially when it uh, comes to climate change. I mean, how does one strike a balance on this? You know, it's, we can't overstate the necessity and need for protecting biodiversity. And I think it's not even lost on those farmers, certainly not lost on environmentalists. I, I don't think that the, the conflict is as, as exaggerated as you might make it. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that not only is you know, the Amazon rainforest are, represent the lungs of the planet and uh, play a critical role in regulating temperature, mm -hmm. biodiversity is, a, is represents a, Approximately two thirds to three quarters uh, of medicines are derived from natural sources. Uh, we track back many, many uses to biodiversity. The, the reality is that the UN has put the uh, rough amount of protecting the world's biodiversity north of $300 billion a year need to be invested to roll back the un ongoing losses of biodiversity. So we've got to increase the amount of money that we're putting into protecting biodiversity, and we've got to do that really, really fast, or else we're going to see biodiversity losses accelerate even, even more. Chang Wu, China has embarked on a major project to, on forestation, that is planting billions of trees. It's a project known as the Great Green Wall. What can you tell us about this effort? This happens to be a bright spot, actually, from China perspective. China, in the last few decades, it's just not today. In the last three or four decades, there has been a united, organized uh, campaign planting trees. And of course, the Northern uh, Green uh, Great Wall project is very symbolic. Uh, but not only limited in that area, but nationwide. So every year, like for instance, March 12th is the day, actually, all the society and uh, going out, basically planting trees. If from the outcome perspective, that's very impressive. If, uh, I think there are global satellite data showing, uh, you know, if you look at the, the green, uh, growing green areas on the planet, and China definitely contributed to maybe a quarter of, of the growth in the last couple of decades there. So that that's definitely has been huge success, and China definitely deserves Deserve. Uh, congratulations there. But the biodiversity is much more complicated than that. And it's not just planting trees. And it's about the whole system, right? All the ecosystems are connected with each other. Uh, land, ocean, even on land, actually, forest, uh, you know, wetlands, uh, you name it, actually. Somehow, I don't think at this moment we have addressed them really well or understood them really well. The Kunming Biodiversity Conference definitely is a symbolic in a way. It's a global or humanity awakening to the crisis on one side of uh, loss of nature but on the other side, actually, really started to say, Let's, we had to do something. One major piece, message coming out of the Kunming Declaration, which I'm very impressed, I feel like where the hope is, is that all governments, you know, secondary countries, have agreed to put protection of habitat, of biodiversity, and the conservation of nature at the core of government policy making in the future. Hopefully, somehow, that's going to be starting point that we're going to be able to pivot, uh, you know, redirect the direction of how we grow our economy, build our infrastructure, and how we protect our nature. Another part of the climate crisis is playing out in Africa. There we've seen major drought problems, and that's causing fears about the impact to farmers and the long-term impact on food production. Josna Puri with the International Fund for Agricultural Development has this message for us. Hello. Climate change has already had a big impact on most aspects of our social and economic systems. But a group that is mostly ignored are farmers of the world. Farmers of the world, and especially those living in poorest countries, are facing unpredictable weather, which is a threat to their very survival. As the IPCC report says as well, drought, storms, heat waves, rising sea levels, and changing ecosystems are going to result in destroyed crops, failed harvests, and animal deaths. As much as a third of the world's food supply comes from small-scale rural farmers in low-income countries, yet they receive less than 2 percent of the global funding for climate adaptation. Ladies and gentlemen, the threat they face is a threat that we all face. Adaptation means increasing the ability of people of communities and of nations to absorb the impacts of climate change, climate vulnerability, and climate uncertainty, and be able to bounce back from shocks that are caused by climate change. If adaptation does not increase, 
if our adaptive capacity does not increase, yields of crops will drop by up to a quarter by the end of the century. And this, unfortunately, will lead to even more hunger and poverty, increased conflict, migration, and global instability. Arunaba Ghosh, uh, the issue of food security is not just an issue for Africa. It's an issue for all developing countries. How will climate change affect our food supplies? I mean, we're already hearing talk of starvations and famine. Absolutely. Uh, there, the issue around food security is so important and it's also ironic because it's happening uh, a few decades after we had a global effort to reduce food insecurity through the Green Revolution that spread across from S Central America to Africa to South Asia to Southeast Asia. And here we are, 50 years after the Green Revolution began, with a situation that a changing climate is now changing uh, the, the soil moisture content, the precipitation patterns, the cropping patterns, uh, and making it much harder to, for farmers, and especially the small and marginal farmers, to grow the crops, uh, but yet do it in a, in a state of complete uncertainty. In India, for instance, we are noticing that 40% of our districts are shifting patterns from being traditionally flood prone to drought prone and vice versa. So how do you decide what kind of crops you want to plant? And when you start looking at it across the developing world, you're looking at trillions of dollars of potential food losses um, or agricultural losses as a result of a warming climate. Now, what's going to be the response to that? When you don't have a, that kind of resilience cushion uh, a way to deal with these shocks, and if these shocks keep happening year upon year upon year, then you create a major crisis, not just in the particular geography, but that then begins to spill over. It creates social instability, political instability, spikes in fruit prices like it happened in 2008, uh, and it's going to happen more frequently in future. And that creates global instability, not just in food markets, but geopolitically as well. This is far beyond just the growing of certain crops. It's, it's, it's absolutely at the core of what a human beings and settled human civilization is all about. Bob Ward, here's another disturbing development. We're already seeing how climate change is forcing people to move. We've seen people trying to cross the Mediterranean uh, and trying to flee to Europe. Not all are climate refugees, but many are. But is this a prelude to what we could see in the future? Well, the climate is going to continue to deteriorate over the next three decades at least. And in parts of the world which are exposed to the uh, impact, for instance, through changes in extreme weather, you're beginning to create the conditions in which people are not resilient enough to uh, withstand these effects, and they do. They move out of the way. They become displaced. Uh, we need to make people more resilient to those impacts, but as the impacts grow larger, you'll get to levels where people start to move, and it won't just be in one place. It will be all across the world because all parts of the world are going to be exposed to these impacts through changes in, in the level of heat waves, in terms of droughts and associated famines, in terms of tropical storms, in terms of heavy rainfall, causing flooding. All these things are all going to be happening all the same time all across the world. It's going to move people around. And we know that when you have large populations moving about, you're creating the conditions for conflict. Indeed, many national security agencies around the world, they describe climate change as a threat multiplier. You're imposing it on countries that might already be have troubled circumstances. And it, the effects of climate change are push them over the edge and start triggering conflict. And we know that war and conflict is the most devastating activity known to man. It's responsible for destroying economic activity and people die. And that's what we're going to see as a result of climate change. Our best chance is we stop the worst effects so that we aren't all engulfed by chaos. But there are certainly going to be parts of the world that are, will now find it very difficult to escape from those impacts. Young people are now very engaged as climate change activists. And I talked recently with a teenager from South Africa, Ayako Melitafa. She got involved in climate activism after drought impacted her family farm. I asked her to tell me what she sees as some of the biggest problems across Africa. Let's listen. 
droughts that are happening, um, the loss of biodiversity, um, the effect on agriculture climate change is having, it's really proving um, to show that food insecurity is going to be um, a wildly increasing thing in the African continent. Um, and as we are a struggling continent as it is, we really need to start asking these questions, speaking up about our stories and really taking charge to make sure that we are not affected um, by climate change. I've heard you say before that the people who are least responsible for what is happening right now are often the most impacted by climate change. What did you mean by that? Um, by that I mean that we see that the vast majority of people in Africa that get the most affected by climate change are the ones that contribute the least. Um, I mean we're already um, we're not very developed, meaning we don't really contribute a lot to the economy, we don't really contribute a lot to um, fossil fuel production, and the people that are contributing the most are the ones that um, don't seem to be bearing the brunt of climate change. So that's what I'm trying to encourage here in the Global South, is that we introspect, we see where the problem is, and we try to speak out and vocalize, because we really are going to be suffering if we reach the point of 1.5 degrees and go further. African continent will be way hotter, so it's quite important that we start now and we start speaking up. Michael Dorsey, I want to get back to that point that Ayaka makes that, that the developing world is the least responsible for climate change, yet it is feeling the greatest impact right now. She does have a great point there, doesn't she? She absolutely does. I mean, that phenomena that she was identifying, we call it climate injustice. And really, the reality is, is that the unfolding climate crisis is a, isn't evenly distributed around the world. Uh, those that are indeed uh, emitting less uh, because they are poorer, they don't uh, have the livelihood to drive big cars, have not just a house or let alone two or three houses, those are the poorest amongst us uh, in the global south, in, in Africa and Asia, but also inside of developed countries. The, the poorest of the poor were those that lost their lives uh, in the, the northeast of the United United States uh, with Hurricane Ida. Those folks were uh, you know, incredibly poor. They were marginalized, worker, working class people. So the burden of this uh, problem falls disproportionately on those that are on the margins of society. And we, if we're really going to tackle the unfolding climate crisis, we've got to understand the way in which climate injustice disproportionately harms those that are on the margins of society. And we've got to put more resources into those communities. We've got to make sure that they have the capacity to be more resilient. Uh, we've got to get more capital and, and, and infrastructure to help them out. Let's turn now to yet another part of the climate crisis. CGTN reporter Adel El Makruki reports from Egypt on the threat to coral in the Red Sea. Let's watch. Outside of Southeast Asia's coral triangle, the Red Sea has the most biologically diverse coral reef communities in the world. 10% of the species are endemic, meaning they can only be found in this part of the world. We think of corals as colorful, but it's actually algae that gives them color. They are microorganisms that use coral as shelters, but at the same time produce nutrients for them. Because of climate change, the oceans are getting warmer, which is driving algae away, bleaching the coral's color and ultimately killing them. Yet in the Red Sea, scientists have found so-called super corals, species that are resistant to heat. That raises hope that coral here may survive long after coral in other parts of the world has died off. The Red Sea is among the world's top spots for scuba diving. In Egypt, coral reef-related tourism contributes 3.5% to the country's gross domestic product. So to this North African nation, preserving coral is not only good for the environment, but is crucial for the economy. This is Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Ain Sukhna, Egypt. Changwa Wu, for now it seems that the Red Sea is surviving the climate crisis, but we have rising levels of acid in the ocean, and could that change? I mean, we've already seen the damage done in places like the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. I think we have very good knowledge today in terms of understanding the threat to coral reefs. Corals actually pretty much is the habitat for most of the marine biodiversity. That's why they are so critical, so important, and we need to protect them. Uh, so there are probably spots in our oceans globally here and there still sort of surviving at this moment. But the bigger change is very, you know, devastating. Uh, if things do not change, and uh, they are going to be dramatically threatened there. Three major challenges or risk threats to corals uh, biodiversity or health. Uh, one is warming, and the temperature warming definitely damaging the life, marine life. 
and the second is acidity, uh, because the ocean uh, absorbs a large chunk of the human-made, uh, you know, emissions, uh, greenhouse gases emissions there. And the third, actually, is the pollution, particularly from land-based solutions, their nutrients, among others there. So if now we understand the root causes of the damage or threat to corals uh, worldwide, globally, uh, so we need to organize actions to address that. Uh, if not in a timely manner, we definitely are going to uh, be on a no-return pathway towards the future. That's going to be dramatically threatened, not only the marine life or biodiversity, but people's livelihood and the nutrition and food system as well. We will deal in depth later in the week on solutions to the climate crisis, but we heard recently from the managing director of the IMF on an economic approach. Let's listen. What we recommend is first to urge policymakers to put incentives in place that underpin the transition to a low carbon economy. There are two incentives that economists embrace, and we embrace them at the fund. One, eliminate harmful subsidies. Two, put a price on carbon. And actually, putting a price on carbon, in a sense, adds to eliminate subsidies just by making full cost assessment uh, in production and a signal to consumers in that regard. What are we talking about? We are talking about carbon price going, global average carbon price going up from $3 a ton, where it is today, to $75 a ton in 2030. Bob Ward, very briefly, what is your view on this? Do we need to put a price on carbon? Yes, as Kristalina Georgieva was saying, we need to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. There's no justification for uh, artificially depressing the price of fossil fuels. And what's more, when you pay for goods and services at the moment, usually there's an implicit subsidy if it's involved uh, fossil fuels that have released carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So what happens is the price you're paying does not reflect the cost it's imposing on other people through the damage caused by climate change and, for instance, local air pollution. So carbon pricing is a way of removing that implicit subsidy and putting back on the price a full reflection of its cost. When you do that, you're effectively removing that implicit subsidy and cleaner solutions, cleaner goods and services, then can compete on a level playing field and you get a less of a distortion in the market. Because as Nicholas Stern said when he published his major review of the economics in 2006, climate change is a result of the largest market failure the world has ever seen. And carbon pricing is an essential part of correcting that market failure. Chang Wu, we will be reporting more on climate change solutions in the next few days, but very briefly as well, please, can you give us a sense of China's main goals uh, as far as climate change is concerned and combating climate change in the days, months and years ahead? Sure. Uh, the biggest uh, part of the national strategy is called the National Clean Energy Transition, with one particular strategy now being uh, sought, you know, put on the table is to shift the national energy system from relying on coal to, you know, uh, uh, to put clean energy, renewable energy in particular, at the core of the future national energy system. That's the biggest piece of the puzzle on the table, so that we'll be able to build up the convergence of communication technology, renewable uh, energy technology, and the clean mobility, transportation, energy form the infrastructure so that we'll be able to become the launching pad, actually, for the country for much accelerated clean energy transition. Thanks to all of you for being with us. It has been a fascinating discussion. Over the coming days, we will bring you much more on CGTN's GAI Action Initiative Project Earth. For more of our GAI content, check out our website at www.globalactioninitiative.com. You'll find full episodes of all our daily shows, exclusive documentaries focused on climate change, speeches and interviews with our VIP guests, and feature stories on everyday heroes fighting to save the planet. And if you're really in a hurry, just scan the QR code below with your mobile phone.
Let's turn now to COP26, the major global climate summit taking place in Glasgow. Can leaders and climate experts make a difference? Joining me now from Beijing is Ma Tianji. He is the managing editor for China Dialogue. Also with us here in Washington, D.C. is Paul Bledsoe. He is an adjunct lecturer at American University Center for Environmental Policy. Thanks to both of you for joining us. And Ma Tianji, let me start with that statement that President Xi Jinping issued to the COP26 summit. He called for a number of things. Among them, he emphasized the importance of multilateralism for nations to pull together and cooperate to combat climate change. Are you hopeful that after this conference, we will see more of that and nations will indeed honor the commitments they make? I am hopeful because I think one of the biggest change from the last time is that the U.S. is back on board. Um, and I think that sort of changes the dynamic quite a lot. Uh, but of course, the success is very much dependent on, uh, for example, how much financing uh, the developed countries has uh, are, are willing to put on the table. They have committed to a hundred billion U.S. dollar a year uh, commitment in the past, but that hasn't been met yet. And I think that's critical. Uh, on how much uh, commitment and sort of actions the developing countries are willing to put on the table because uh, climate change negotiations is like a, basically an interlocking chessboard, like uh, all the countries need to move together in order to achieve the, the 1.5 degree goal that the UN has said that it is critical to meet uh, for this COP. Right, Martin, and when you say you are hopeful, did you get the sense that there is some urgency right now on what is happening? Yes, I think there's. It, it, the UN has indicated the urgency, like very, uh, uh, a, a very urgent situation, because we have a quickly narrowing window of action. Uh, we only have about eight years to have global emissions, and we're far from there. I think uh, by the UN's assessment, we are only about seven, uh, seven point five percent reduction by uh, 2030, when the world actually needs uh, 55 percent. Right. So I think. There are a lot that countries need to basically up the ante on their climate commi commitments and climate actions. Paul Bledsoe, this is being called a critical moment, uh, a time when COP26 is taking place. But what are your thoughts? Do you think it will make much of a difference? I mean, what kind of efforts do you see here in the United States, not just from the federal government, but also from state governments and from corporations, of course? Well, the biggest thing that's happened so far is the huge commitments by over 100 countries to cut uh, methane, a uh, super climate pollutant, by 30 percent by the end of this decade. Um, it, cutting methane deeply along with the other super pollutants can limit warming uh, by 30 percent of the rise by 2050, helping prevent climate tipping points. I hope that China will join those hundred nations along with Russia and other countries that haven't signed on for this methane pledge. It's a, a very big accomplishment, but all nations need to get on board. The good news, uh, as was said before, is that the U.S. is finally back in the game and taking action. But we need the U.S. Congress to pass legislation that the president has put together. He's got a deal. I, I'm told the House of Representatives may have votes as early as later this week. But this legislation, domestic U.S. legislation, has to pass Congress. And as you say, the states are beginning to act, mm -hmm. and corporations are taking very serious uh, emissions reductions pledges and making big investments in clean energy. So I actually think that this um, meeting, this negotiations, have produced more good, strong outcomes in the first two days than any previous meeting. And it gives me some hope that world leaders are finally taking this crisis seriously. Martian Ji, as Paul points out, China has to sign on to all these agreements. What more can China do? I think China has already uh, updated its 2030 goals, which is a very good sign that it is willing to uh, meet the demand for higher ambitions uh, on tackling climate change. Of course, there are a host of actions China can still take domestically. One of the key items is whether China is willing to set up an absolute cap um, for carbon emissions uh, instead of a, a relative like intensity target. Um, I think everybody is also watching how much China still uh, want to do with the coal sector domestically. It has already committed to stopping 
uh, building new coal-fired uh, power plants overseas, but domestically there is still pressure uh, in order to keep uh, energy security and energy stability. There is still pressure to build um, coal power plants, and 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 to what extent China is willing to uh, keep a tap and and keep a cap on on the development domestically right. is, I think, something that everybody will be watching. Right, Martin. CGT in America recently talked with the World Bank Vice President Jurgen Vogele. We talked about this debate, and we're hearing a lot about this over economic development versus environmental concerns. Let's listen to what he had to say. There is a narrative out there uh, that you know there is always a trade-off. You either develop or you take care of the environment, and the reality is that is not the case. There are cases that have to be looked at and have to be worked through. But we are increasingly learning that green, resilient, inclusive development that really brings people along, that has a lower footprint, both broader environment footprint, but also a lower carbon footprint, can actually create more jobs than staying with the old, so to speak, approach. Uh, simply because the technology, that's one major reason, is that the cost of the new technologies is rapidly decreasing. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you've experienced this in China with the solar uh, energy, right, which was expensive at the beginning, but very quickly came down, quite significantly. Whereas old technology, uh, coal, uh, you know, fossil fuels, while they are still important, right, for, to, to power the economy, as, as we see right now, I mean, right now, we, this is a very complex situation right now, but their cost curve doesn't go down. So over time, you will see that the, you know, the, the newer, greener uh, economy will actually be cheaper. It will create more jobs, it will create better jobs, and it will be better for longer-term sustainable growth. Martin G, President Xi also talked about uh, the need to accelerate the green transition. Do you agree that the green transition can be moved along without any uh, sacrifice to economic development? Yes, if the last decade has taught us anything, uh, it's that the green transition is very much aligned with, I think, China's economic ambitions. Um, as, as we have mentioned, solar energy, solar, solar technology, and uh, electric electric vehicles, these are actually the frontier of the, the sort of the next engine for China to grow its economy. And I think the Chinese leadership is very much aware of it, and is sort of betting on the, the future of, of growth. And that's why we're seeing that the, the, the government is trying to align um, the green transition with its broader economic uh, pursuits uh, by investing heavily into those sectors um, and, and seeing them as the, the, the source of growth for the next decade or, or decades to come. Paul Bledsoe, we also heard President Xi uh, say in his statement that uh, developing countries need more help from developed countries. Uh, we also heard some of our guests talk about that, that the, de the developed world needs to help the developing world. How do developed countries, industrialized countries, respond to this call? Well, the Biden administration has quadrupled its uh, initial $4 billion, $4 billion annual pledge to $16 billion a year uh, for developing countries. And then President Biden announced a new $3 billion on top of that just yesterday. So that's $19 billion a year from the United States alone. We have to make sure Congress passes legislation to authorize and appropriate that money. But that's a huge uh, down payment on $100 billion a year that uh, developed uh, countries have promised. We also have to find ways to get clean energy into the hands of the world's poor and those who are lack energy right now. There has to be a social justice angle to the clean energy transition where lower income people have access to clean energy and it helps provide improve their lives improve their health yeah and 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 provide them employment as well so there there's an important social justice angle to climate protection final question martin g uh, with all the global attention that climate change is getting right now are you hopeful that we can still avoid the red alert climate warnings that we've been dealing with i am um and also i think it's important to to note that um a 1.5 world will be radically different from a 2.0 uh, degree world, and a 2.0 degree world will be radically different um, from a 2.5 degree world. So uh, a little bit of reduction, a little bit of emission reduction makes a huge difference, right? So I think everybody should be aware that 
that the actions that we take today do actually make a difference for our future generations. Okay, and uh, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Before we close, uh, before we go, just a quick reminder on what's ahead during our GAI Global Action Initiative 2021, Project Earth. We will explore the challenge to biodiversity and we'll take you to the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland for a look at how it's dealing with the climate crisis. Later in the week, you'll also hear from students and the solutions they are proposing. So from me, Arnand Naidu and CGTN, I want to say thank you to all our guests. Next, please stay with us for a CGTN documentary, Zero Hour Climate Change in China. <laughs>